feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Stuff that dreams are made of. Gentlemen, you can't fight in here. This is the war room. One morning, I shot an elephant in my pajamas. How he got in my pajamas, I don't know. I am. It's a picture that got small. Go ahead. Make my day. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Hello and welcome to Front Row Classics, a production of the Front Row Network of Shows, where we take a look at some of the greatest films ever made. And here's your host, Brandon Davis. Well, hello to everybody out there in podcast land. This is the Front Row Network. I'm your host, Brandon Davis, and this is another episode of Front Row Classics with NPR Illinois Community Voices. And uh, join with me, as always, is my co-host, Eric Flick. How's it going, Eric? It's going really well, Brandon. How are you? Very good. Very good. You know, it, uh, we love talking to interesting people, and uh, we are talking to another very interesting person. Uh, we're talking to uh, Natasha Gregson Wagner today, who is the uh, daughter of Natalie Wood, stepdaughter of Robert Wagner. And uh, she recently, just this last year, wrote a wonderfully touching memoir called More Than Love, an intimate portrait of my mother, Natalie Wood. And uh, Eric, you and I both had a chance to read it. And it, it, it's a very, very heart heartwarming and heartbreak. We tell her in the interview and a heartbreaking book. But, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a touching book. Uh, obviously, uh, Natalie Wood was taken from the earth far too young. And so that colors a lot of what you uh, get in the book and colors a lot of the conversation that we have with with Natasha. Uh, but it's also an important topic. I mean, and it, it's a, a something that everybody's life is going to touch on at some point. None of us are, are going to make it through this uh this thing called life alive so uh we uh we get a little heavy uh, in this one yeah but uh, you know th- th- what what the book also really brings home is that um you know unfortunately the media over the years has really focused on her death and how she died but what this book really sets out to do is really celebrate the life, the 43 years that we got of Natalie Wood. And uh, she packed a lot into 43 years. She raised, you know, she raised two daughters, um, you know, and started did, acting at, started a, at a very five, young. Yeah. I know. I, I believe I, I, we didn't ask her, but in the book, I think they said a few more years, even though she was in her mid 40s, she would have qualified for a pension yeah. from yeah. because she'd been acting since she was, you know, four or five years old. So, yeah. You know, just an amazing, amazing life. And she also uh, recently has a documentary on HBO Max called What Remains Behind. And that uh, documentary is fascinating as well. And um, I think we need to just say this um, off the bat. We do touch a little bit on the tragedy of Natalie's death, but this is not what the focus of this interview is about. We didn't want to, um, you know, discuss any of the, you know, gotcha stuff that a lot of uh, TV shows might tend to if they were interviewing her. We really just wanted to celebrate the life of her mom's, uh, talk about Natasha's life. And she really, really, um, we have a great discussion. We really do. Yeah, yeah. Well said. I mean, the, if you're tuning in to to find out what happened on the boat that night, you're not going to find that here. There's other sources for that. We're a classics movie podcast, and we want to talk about one of the great stars of the of, of the movie classics, Natalie Wood. Right. And we did that. It was a wonderful conversation. Yeah, wonderful. So uh, we will uh, just go right into it because we we cover a lot of topics, and I think I think you're going to enjoy it. So. We will uh, start our interview now with Natasha Gregson Wagner. Natasha, thank you so much for joining us today. We we really appreciate you spending time with us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm it's I love to talk about these things that you guys want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How? Uh, well, first of all, I mean it's been a crazy year with uh, the release of your book and everything came during you know a uh, you know worldwide pandemic yeah. how uh, how have you been dealing this last year and your family um we thankfully have all stayed healthy we um we have a place in northern michigan so last march when the pandemic sort of started to feel like it was really a real big Thing to contend with we got in the car my husband and my daughter and I and our dogs and we drove to Michigan where we stayed until August last August 
and then came back to LA for the, the Zoom school year, which we could have actually stayed up there, but, and then we, we've just spent the summer up there again. And, you know, up where we are in this small area called Leelanau County, you know, it's very, it doesn't really feel like a pandemic is going on because there's so much outdoor space, there's so much natural distancing, but being back in Los Angeles, you know, wearing masks again, and, uh -huh. and we're sort of feeling like it's back to where we started, I guess. Yeah. A little, yeah. Yeah, we're Dude. we're we're in Illinois, so there's a wide oh. open spaces here, but still, it depend just depends on where you go. Yeah, right, Why, right. Because Chicago's had it pretty bad, huh? They have. We're about uh, we're about three hours south of Chicago. We're right in the middle of the state, but yeah, we uh, are. Uh, although Springfield, Eric, I think's been getting it bad too. Yeah, yeah. You know, it it, it is what it is. You know, you you do your best. So mm -hmm. and. Uh, I just, I think you're wise to summer there in Michigan and then leave before the snow comes and go to, to LA. That's, that sounds like a good plan. So, well, I have to say that for my daughter and I, who are California girls, my husband is from Michigan. We were very, I mean, we got there in early March. So we got to see you know, the sort of the snow melt and it turned into spring and then spring turned into summer. So we, we thought that was really amazing and exciting, mm -hmm. but I hear that it's a novelty that wears off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Very quickly. Yeah. When you have to right. get on a snowmobile to go get groceries, that, that oh is a little God. bit different. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that does not sound fun. No. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, we thank you once again for joining us. And um, we, Eric and I, first of all, both read the book and I love the book. Um, it's it's so it's heartwarming. It's heart wrenching everything in between and uh, really paints a wonderful portrait of your mom and your family. And uh, you you mentioned in there even that, um, you, you know, it, it took you a long time to publicly open up about everything. And so uh, what what was yeah. the impetus for writing the book and for, um, you know, just speaking on it in a more public way? I think the impetus for me was really having my daughter in 2012. Mm -hmm. um, that was the, that was the event that really made me feel like a grown up. I had tried so hard to feel like a grown up, you know, with various other steps that I had taken in my life, but it wasn't really until I became a mother that I, I felt this, this feeling of gravity and, and in, intensity in my, in my, in my person, you know, and so I, I had Clover and then I turned 43, which is, I became older than my mom got to be. And I started to think about the impact that my mom's legacy would have on my daughter and um i i worked on a fragrance that i had sort of was sort of a lark kind of just a creative thing but i i did an article um i was interviewed for the new york times magazine for the style section about the fragrance and i spoke very candidly to katie rossman the journalist and the morning that the article came out i was like oh my gosh, what have I done? I've never been so forthcoming and so honest. And it was on the cover of the style section. There was just like nowhere to hide. But I read the article and I felt so good. I felt really proud. I felt really liberated. I, I felt that I could stand behind everything that I said. And I realized that speaking publicly was actually a, a doorway toward more independence and, and freedom and self-worth. And so mm. that was sort of what got me on the path of thinking more about speaking about my mom and our family and the night she died and who she was as, as, a, as a performer and as a woman and as a parent and a wife and all of those those things and that's one of the things i loved about the book though is it's not only uh a reflection on your mom's work but who she was as a person and 
you know, I'm 44 years old and I've got a couple of kids and it's just really heartwarming to, uh, to see a kid's perspective of, of their parent and then to have that all come full circle where you've got this wonderful section at the end of the, of the book uh, where you describe your relationship with your daughter and then also the relationship that you're growing between your daughter and your mother uh, as well. What is your daughter's probably a nine. nine ish now. Yeah. So what, what does she feel about uh, her grandmother and does she enjoy watching her movies? Well, my daughter is definitely a performer in her own right. I don't know how that will manifest as she grows, but she likes the spotlight. <laughs> um, she loves, she's dramatic. She has a real ear for dialogue and, and timing, which she gets a lot from the sitcoms that she watches, like <laughs> Harry Danger and Jesse and these things. But but her her delivery is excellent. So she has that going for her. But in terms of her grandma, Natalie, which is how she, she speaks of her, um, I, I feel like she has a relationship with her grandma. You know, she's very articulate about who she was, that she was an actress. She's seen a few of her movies. She's seen West Side Story, Rebel Without a Cause, um, bits of Inside Daisy Clover, obviously. she you know, that film is not appropriate. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, nor has she seen Splendor, but she's seen Driftwood and um, The Green Promise and, you know, films that my mom did when she was a little girl, Miracle on 34th Good. Street. And um, it was funny because she was, she was coming home at the end of the school year last year with a friend of mine and um, her mom, the grandma was in the car and the grandma started asking Clover, you know, well, do you, is your grandma, do you see your grandma? Is your grandma live nearby, you know? And, and my friend said that Clover took a long pause and goes, it's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was like, like she got that like, the car ride from school to the friend's house, there wasn't enough time to get into the whole thing. So let's just move on from there, you know? <laughs> That's an amazing level of maturity, though, because she knew that even just one little piece of information is going to lead to a thousand questions. And mm -hmm. she knew just, I'm going to put the kibosh on this right now. <laughs> Completely, yeah. And so, but I do really feel like Clover um, has a connection to her grandma and will will bear, I don't, I, I, I feel that this won't be a burden for my daughter. Mm. I feel that this will be something that she, you know, a legacy that she will be proud of and that I've sort of let her in on that early on in her life. So hopefully she can be a part of, of my mom's legacy as well. I love I love the moment in the book and you talked about Miracle on 34th Street when you had the full circle moment of your mom watching you watch Miracle on 34th Street and then you watching your daughter watch it. That's... I know. It's crazy, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I feel, you know, obviously it's, you know, I would prefer that my mom was here with us, but yeah. But and I, I'm not the only daughter that's lost a mother or Clover's not the only grandchild that doesn't know her grandmother. But what we have with these moving pictures, we have, you know, we have her in front of us. And so it's like this incredible archive that we can that we can go to. And so I feel so grateful for that, for yeah. myself, for my daughter, for for my stepchildren, for my husband, you know, for anybody that wants to get to know my mom, we, we have that. We have her on film. Mm. And more than that, right? Because you describe in the book how your mother was a meticulous note taker. And mm -hmm. so there's, there's a lot of uh, writing that she did that you have access to as well, correct? Yes, there, there is. I mean, I have, I have photo albums. We have all that that footage, the Super 8 and the, um, 
you know, 16 millimeter and ton of, a ton of that that wasn't in the in the documentary and a lot of her writings. I'm actually working with somebody right now. Um, well, I can't say too much about it, but no, we understand. With sure. Her, with her writings. And yes, yeah, so so it's almost like if this tragedy were to happen, it happened to the right family in a way hmm. because she was such a fastidious um chronicler of her own life yeah so i i assume that she would be heavy into instagram and all of that if she was around during that yeah i went well when email first started you know my <laughs> my godfather mark crowley and i would joke that it would have been like her favorite thing because she was constantly writing letters and or sending a telegram or a you know all that stuff she just loved to stay in touch with her friends um so email, the cell phone would have been, you know, so <laughs> huge. And, in, and then Instagram pictures and, and just having a voice, you know, ha being able to have a platform like all this social media does for performers, I think she would have really loved too. Hmm. Definitely. As you've embraced the, the, the newish role of uh, being a parent, uh, and you're presenting those works to to your daughter. Is there something that speaks more to you uh, when you go back and watch uh, the the films that your that your mother made? Are there certain ones that you look at differently now? Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's a really good question. Well, I certainly feel more maternal towards my mom because I'm older than she yeah. ever got to be. And sometimes when I watch her her roles when she was a little girl or in her early 20s, you know, I just want to like scoop her up and, and give her a big hug, you know, or tell her all those things that she was worried weren't going to happen. They all happened. You know, she, she got to marry, she got to remarry my daddy Wagner. She, she got to have children. She had the family that she didn't feel that she had growing up you know and so I, I I see her as such a this just youthful sort of beautiful vulnerable but strong paradoxical figure um, and then watching her when she was my mom and some of her television work I think that's a little more painful for me because that's the person that I miss, you know, that's yeah. the mom, the way she speaks to her children when she's a mom in some of these roles. And, you know, that's how I remember her. And so I don't really watch those that much. I guess, so. I guess the answer is it's easier for me to watch the movies she did in the fifties and the sixties up until like 75. And then I don't really watch the older mm -hmm. one because that's like i miss that i miss her so much in those in those films yeah yeah definitely well you, well you mentioned your uh daddy wagner and um how important what what struck me when i read the book is you know the the importance of the two fathers in your life yeah. your 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 biological father richard gregson and then your uh, stepfather robert wagner who both you know, were equal fathers to you. Um, the, talk about how, the, talk about that relationship with those two men. Well, I think it's probably more common now to have mm -hmm. two fathers than it was in the seventies when I was growing up. I didn't really know anyone that had two fathers. Um, and I think because it was introduced to me when at such an early age, I just accepted the fact that I had them both um but they were very different kinds of men and I and I joke that my husband is like a split down the middle of both <laughs> of my dads um which I think is a compliment to both of my dads because it means that I I liked both of them enough to pick a husband you know that reminded <laughs> me of them but my my daddy Wagner is you know he is a much more he moves more from his heart and his emotions and he's so supportive and he's he's very idealistic 
my daddy Gregson was incredibly cerebral. He had a real, you know, work ethic, education ethic. I could not mess around with him at all. Mm -hmm. um, but he was completely devoted to me. And I think that I, I really felt, I really felt loved by both of them. And, um, and that if I, if I was going to go down the wrong path that they were going to write me, you know? And so I, I, I really appreciate the, the, the strict nature of my daddy Gregson and then the sort of really ideologically whimsical nature of, of my daddy Wagner. And they were really um, united in their relationship. I mean, if there were, a, if there ever was, you know, issues between them, they never let me know about that, which I think is so impressive, you know? I mean, we know being parents, we see other parents getting divorced. We see acrimonious breakups. And I just, I, I lucked out in that department where I didn't, I didn't pick up on any of the acrimony if there was, you know, and, and the, the first, for my first marriage, they both walked me down the aisle, which was so cool, you know, and mm -hmm. when my daddy Gregson was so ill with Parkinson's, my daddy Wagner would call and check in on him a lot you know he they they had great regard for each other that's great how is uh how is uh um, daddy wagner doing i i, I know he's 91 90 wonderful <laughs> yes <laughs> he is great so um in june we drove we always drive to michigan i don't know we just do this this is like, <laughs> although my daughter said to me today I said, why don't you want to go? I needed her to go on a couple errands with me before I was taking her to a friend's. And she's like, mom, you make me sit in a car for 13 hours, three days in a row. How could you expect me to want to drive around with you? You know, and I like, <laughs> that, is, that is very true. That is very true. But um, so anyway, we stopped, we always stop in Aspen where my dad and Jill live and we stayed with them for a few days. And I mean, I hadn't seen him in over a year. So I was a little, I mean, I FaceTime with him and I talked to him and his voice, he still has that very robust, vital, uh, you know, tenor in his voice, but he's 91. But you know, he met us in town, drove himself because we were dropping our dogs off at the at the shelter for a couple of days because he's got a dog, and so you know, so he met us there. He's friends with everyone at the shelter. Then we came home. He made dinner for us. He wow. taught his daughter how to play poker. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's just like he's kind of unbelievable in this in this life force that he has and and i asked him at dinner one night i said what is the best and worst thing about being 91 and he said the hardest thing is not being able to physically do the things that he used to be able to do and the loss of so many of his friends yeah. and the best part is still being alive and still being healthy and still being able to be with his family and the friends that are alive. So, but I think it's definitely bittersweet at 91, mm -hmm. but he's doing amazing. I mean, you know, any day we don't know, but I, I am very, I hope that I'm doing as well as him when I'm 91. That's yeah. Just yeah. Like absolutely very relevant you know we were talking about the val kilmer documentary and i was asking him if he had watched um roadrunner the anthony bourdain documentary you know he's very much he stays stays current with everything that's going on which i think is great well that's great yeah it keeps the mind active yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he's an amazing poker player i mean <laughs> that man he, he gets flushes and straights and all these things. It's just like, I don't know, he, 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 he's lucky. He's lucky, <laughs> lucky guy. <laughs> well, what do you think your mother would have been like, had tragedy not struck, what, what would her career arc have been 
uh, if she had been able to continue that? I think that her career arc would have gone in lots of directions. I think she would have definitely directed film. I think she would have written a memoir. Um, I think she would have optioned projects to produce. Um, I could see her, you know, doing a lot of work with the Me Too movement. I think she would have been very forward thinking in her, um, in the choices she made like she, like she was. And I think she would have championed young actresses. You know, she had so much wisdom and she was so generous, which I think came across in the documentary. She was so gener generous with That's other right. actresses. She didn't come from a place of, of less or jealousy. And so I think she would have really, you know, that's one of the, the many things that's so sad. I think there was still so much that she didn't get to do. And she was in a way just getting started. I think her, her acting work would have deepened. I, I, I wonder a lot, um, we were visiting my sister Courtney in Nashville on our way back from, from Michigan. Um, and Courtney and I were talking about, you know, what would she look like? Cause she'd be 82, I think. And, mm. and so, you know, would she have let her hair go gray? Would she have gotten a facelift? Would she have, you know, gotten into playing those older lady roles? I mean, would she have looked like our grandma who, you know, is hilarious. Uh. And I don't know, <laughs> so we were just taking this, this flight of fancy about what, what she would have, what she would have been like. I, I don't know. Sometimes I think, would she look you know, as incredible as Jane Fonda. I mean, she certainly was vain and was aware that she was a beauty. And I don't think she would have wanted that to go away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's such a, it is, she would have, she would have done so she much. A, yeah. And she was a natural beauty. She wouldn't have had to have done much work anyway. No, 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 not at all. But I think, I don't think she would have been mad at like a yeah. tiny bit of Botox here and there. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, none of that stuff was really happening when she was alive. So uh -huh. who, who knows what she would have done, but yeah. I think she would have been very into family and her granddaughter and, and, um, uh -huh you know, her friends. And I think she would have probably done a lot of, wanted to work with friends a lot. You know, sure. she, she made such great friends on films and stayed really close to them. So I think that would have, she would have done that and, and, and her, her group of friendships would have expanded, you know, based on the different projects that she worked on. I mean, would you say that she discovered Robert Redford? I mean, <laughs> well, <laughs> He said, he said that she, you know, chose him for his first film role. So, I mean, she didn't discover him because he was on Broadway, right? But she went to, um, she went to see him perform and based on that performance said, I want him for the, the film for Inside Daisy Clover and the studio was like, well, who, what, what, no, you know, we want, <laughs> and, and she, but she had approval of her leading man. And then she, after that, she chose him again for this property is condemned. And I think that they didn't want him for that one either because, because um, I think they wanted somebody else, but she was one of the few actresses that had you know, approval of her leading man. And that, that was a big deal back then. I mean, that was, that's sort of the thing that's so fascinating about my mom is that she had all this power, you know, she was kind of a baller, but she yeah. never, she never operated like that. I mean, she was certainly the boss of our household and of my dad's and, you know, but she, and she got what she wanted but she didn't do it in an unattractive way. She sort mm -hmm. of was, and, and she, she was still feminine and she was still delicate, but she was tough. Well, and that's what, well, that's I, gather, what I gather 
when I watch her movies, she was just so brave. Um, the, 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 there was such bravery to all of it and the, her performances and she was brave in real life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my, my godfather, Mark, we were, who passed away last March, but he and I were speaking about her during when I was, I called him a lot when I was writing the book to just check in with different things or, and, um, I said something to him like, well, was she scared? And he was like, scared? I mean, she was tougher than all of us, you know? And I mean, of course she was scared. I can't remember what, what we were talking about, but he's like, she held everybody up. But I think that came at a price because I mean, she was supporting her family since she was 12 years old. Um, she never stopped supporting her family, you know, after she died, my, my daddy Wagner was supporting my, her family. And so I think that there was, you know, I think she wanted to be taken care of a little bit too, not necessarily financially, but in other ways, you know, emotionally. And so I guess I feel like I am taking care of her now, you know, where I have, where I have created the book and the documentary and some other stuff that, that that's in the work so that I can protect her and give her a soft landing, you know, mm -hmm. or that's my goal. What are my goals? Because you kind of touched on it with what you just said there about, you know, she took care of a lot of people and needed to take care of herself that that kind of made me think of, and you're very open about it in the book about uh, a lot of folks uh, discussing their problems with therapists. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that this, this book's really a, a great advocate for going and, and doing that. And I think if the last year and a half, two years have shown us anything that mental health is really a big issue and, and, and needs to be addressed, are you still uh, an advocate for going to, to speak with therapists? Uh, you know, what are your, what's your take on that in a, in a 2021 setting? Completely. I completely advocate any kind of self-reflection, whether it's through meditation or yoga or uh, therapy. I, I am in therapy at present. I go in and out of it kind of depending on what I am working on or what's coming up in my life that I want to dig a little deeper. I also have been a meditator for a long time and I, I started doing that because I was, I had read a lot of Buddhist literature and I found it so comforting when having gone through grief or a, a loss of somebody that I loved because um, the way the Buddhists look at death is very different than the way us Westerners do. And so I found that to be very, very comforting. And, you know, they talk about when you put your hands together to meditate, you're putting heaven and earth together so you're really connecting both and um so whatever whatever the means is if it's you know deep analysis or there's so many different kinds of therapy now I, i've been hearing yeah. about all kinds and and i mean i i think that the right therapy is the one that that we feel most connected to you know, that works for us. Like I was asking um, a pediatrician neighbor, I said, what's the best mask, you know, that I should give my daughter for school? She said, you know, the best mask is the one that fits. And <laughs> I thought that is great. And I sort of feel like that about therapy or any, anything you do to help yourself. The, the best thing is the one that fits for you. If it's listening to a podcast and learning about great writers or great performers and how they navigated their life and that that affects you then that's a great way to spend an hour if it's you know talking to somebody you know on zoom a therapist then that's a great way to do it if it's micro dosing if it's yoga if it's hot yoga if it's going to the alps and climbing the mountains like if it's nature if it's rescuing animals, like whatever it is, you know, just we have this time, this time goes by so quickly. So what can we do to make our time count and not be miserable? Like uh -huh. I was just listening to um, 
they were I was listening to a podcast about the end of the affair the Graham Greene novel and he he was so he was suffering so much because of his deeply religious roots and he had fallen in love with somebody else and you, you know what I mean it's like so right. I mean let's just I think now all of this stuff is is so much more okay it's okay to say, I can't do, I can't meet you for lunch because I have, I'm seeing my shrink. Like that's not, you're not going to be ostracized yeah. for saying that. Yeah. Or yeah. I, I'm, I'm thinking that I might be feeling more like I want to dress like a boy today and, and tomorrow I'm going to wear a dress, you know, like, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned uh, you mentioned grief, and um, really, I, what I gather from you know the book, you know, grief is the great equalizer. We all deal with it, but when you deal with it in the public eye, the way that you did, um, you know, I can't imagine because you're not only dealing with your grief, but I imagine you're dealing with the world's grief at the same time. Certainly, um, that was one of the hardest parts was dealing with it in the public eye because, especially when I was. 11 and I was so rocked by it and I felt so like I felt so naked and and ashamed that something this this like earth shattering had happened to me I mean I already remember before my mom died feeling like an other because my parents were famous and you know I just wanted to be like every other child that I went to school with and I wasn't and then when my mom died it was like such a media frenzy and we would go places and people would they would corner my sister and I and, and burst into tears and it was like so it was so embarrassing like I was so embarrassed for them for myself yeah. I didn't know how to advocate for myself in those moments I didn't know how to extricate myself I was totally objectified and there there's um I wrote this this piece that we ended up pulling out of the book but I was in my early 30s and I was just get going through my divorce and I was with my best friend Amanda and we were in the shoe department at Barney's and <laughs> I was looking at a pair of shoes and Amanda was across the way someplace else looking at some shoes and this woman is staring at me and I knew I was like oh, I, I know this look she has figured out you know that I'm my mom's daughter and she calls across to her friend across Barney's you know Esther Natalie Wood's daughter like that oh my. And it was like I didn't even now, I, I honestly don't know what, how I was supposed to react in that moment where I could take care of myself, you know, mm -hmm. all I felt was like I, I, so much shame. Like I'm, I'm just this, I'm not Natasha. I'm not my, I'm just this person that she wants to point out as if it's totally fine to do that, you know? And for me, it, it's not like I was famous in my own right at that time or when I was a young child. So they were, people were just coming up to us because of our parents and because of this awful tragedy. So it just like compounded it and made it even more hard to manage. Mm -hmm. No, I can imagine. I mean, that's just... Brandon mentioned it. I mean, everybody has to go through grief, but to do it so publicly had to have been so difficult. Moving past that a little bit, though, I did want to ask you a little bit about your career, because okay. the the book is obviously Brandon and I love classic movies. We love Natalie Wood, but there's a little bit of biography uh, to your book as well. And uh, You've had a great career as an actress and uh, in some wonderful movies that, that we loved. I mean, give, being in a David Lynch film and in High Fidelity, that, that's a, a great resume right there. But now you're also uh, an author and a filmmaker. What's on your horizon? Is there uh, other films that you feel like you want to make? What other stories do you want to tell? That is such a good question. And I wish I knew exactly what <laughs> I, I have 
I have some stuff that I'm working on as a producer. Um, I have another story that I want to write. I, I do want to do some acting, but I just can't imagine it while my daughter is still only nine and my husband is doing a series in Atlanta. So that I feel like is tabled. I think I always joke like, I'm fine to just start acting when I'm Ruth Gordon's age, you know, just be an older, older yeah. lady, yeah. little old lady. Um, but yes, I have more that I want to do. I just haven't, it hasn't coalesced yet. And it's also hard, you know, with the documentary, I had Laurent, I had a partner to help me sort of stay, keep everything in focus. And with my book, I had my editor. And so now I'm, I'm sort of, it's hard as a mother to find that space in your brain you know, and so I'm struggling with that right now, finding that time for myself. And I think it's going to be a lot easier when Clover goes back to school and my husband's in Atlanta. So suddenly I'm going to have the house to myself. <laughs> I, I completely identify with you, by the way. <laughs> right? And so I'm going to, I'm, I have, I was actually thinking today of like what my schedule is going to be starting on Monday of next week of like writing and meditating and exercising like what am I going to do to keep to, to like connect to myself and my creativity and my ideas and all of that so stay tuned great yeah we look forward to whatever's next yeah what can we ask what your husband's filming in Atlanta is that yes. an ongoing series yes, yes he's um filming Ava DuVernay has a new oh. series for the CW called Naomi um, and it's about a black superhero. And my husband, Barry Watson, plays her father, Naomi's father. Fantastic. So, yeah, yeah. And so they it, it will premiere, I believe, in February on the CW. So, and then he's also um, just finished, they're doing a reboot of Highway to Heaven for Lifetime and Jill Scott is playing the Michael Landon role and my husband is playing her sidekick. Huh. So they just finished that um, and that is coming out November 6th um, on Lifetime. So wow. he, he's those 14 months of not working during the pandemic, he's like making up <laughs> for lost time. So I'm happy for him. But everybody is, right? That's kind of the state of the industry is let's get stuff done because we did it. I mean, uh, and while we can. Right. And I mean, gosh, to think those 14 months, that was a long time of, I mean, I guess we weren't locked down completely during those 14 months. It was 14 months of not working for, for Mr. Barry Watson. So <laughs> we, that was the longest he's ever gone. And we were both like, um, so what are we going to do? You know? <laughs> Yeah. Definitely. One of uh, another uh, fascinating part of the book for me, though, is when you were in um, acting class, and I believe it was Splendor in the Grass that you uh, watched, and it was the it was the first time you were sort of able to look past and see your mother's acting technique. Yeah. How um, so? What was that experience like, and how um, did you try to separate your own acting technique from hers? Were you afraid it was going to be too similar? So that was my senior year of high school and mm -hmm. I was in a film class. Film class. We were we were studying the genre melodrama. Okay. The melodrama genre. And um, you know, I didn't know if any of my friends really knew who my mom was or but when I was watching that, I was just it was I was spellbound. Like she was just such a vessel of you know talent and truth and and um and then I, in terms of my acting technique versus hers i mean i think i had a lot more blocks because i was her daughter and because i had lost her so young and so i had sort of i hadn't really grown myself up and and i was really thin and sort of waif-like and I looked so much younger than I actually was and and so Larry Moss the great acting coach he worked with me so much on trying to find you know some gravity and 
and and so it will be interesting to revisit acting now that I feel like an adult and I'm a parent. I was, you know, I just hadn't gone through those kinds of experiences when I was acting, you know, before my daughter was born. Yeah. And I feel like you might have touched on this briefly previously, but uh, one of the things that struck me about the book is how you broke it down into these three sections. And two of them, and for those that haven't read the book yet, I don't think it's a spoiler, but uh, they're, the, the sections are called with, without, but then within. And it seems like those first two are really intuitive. That third one, though, is has this, uh, once you read that section, you, you truly understand it. And it's this beautiful counterpart to those other two. What was your thought process, though, in putting together that within section? What does that mean to you? Well, first of all, the structure of the book was really hard because how do we how do we structure this? Because obviously, it's it's my story, but it's my mom's story, right? But as we were like, as my editor and I were like pulling the taffy and it was getting messier and messier and whoa it was like a hairball we started to think well with and without were pretty obvious Mm -hmm. but the within was so much of the book was about my search for myself and and how I didn't let what happened to me kind of ruin my life and how I, I wanted that I am a self-preservationist, you know, by nature. And so the within and that therapy was such a big part of uh, and has been such a big part of my life. So the within just made, I mean, in a way, the within is like the most personal part of it for me, because that's, that is who I am. I am someone that wants to connect to my, my inner self. It's more important to me than wearing makeup or going shopping or like, I really want to be an authentic person in the world. And that was not something that came easily to me. I had to fight for it. And so um, that's where the within came from. Oh, and I think for me too, it's kind of beautiful that in in that same section, you talk about how a lot of things from your mother still live within you, but then maybe the most beautiful part is that uh, you have this daughter that literally comes from within you. Uh, yeah. And so it, it kind of wraps everything up so, so nicely and so beautifully. I think it was a brave way to put the the book together. And I, I really liked that and, and enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. It was not easy. There were many sleepless nights of like, this book sucks. I have nothing to say. <laughs> what am I doing? I feel so bad for this publishing company that gave me this advance because I'm going to let them down. <laughs> you know, it was a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> and and w- what I love is, of course, as we all know, over the last you know few decades, the world has made assumptions about everything from your mom's life to how she died to everything else. But with this book, you sort of took the narrative back and you made it your own and your family's. And I think I think that's that's the fantastic part is it really, uh, I think so much of the media focus has been on her death for so long and we really can now finally celebrate her life. Well, thank you for saying that. That was really important to me. I didn't even know that I was going to get into all of that when I wrote the first 10 chapters of the book I really thought that the book was just going to be about my my mom and me and our relationship and Clover and and but it was just like it was absolutely had to deal with just like in the documentary and it was one of those things that it was like I was scared to deal with it 
But then once I, I faced it head on, it was like this, this place of empowerment because I got to tell my side. I allowed my daddy Wagner to speak about his side and, and that feels really good to take the narrative back and to be like, hold on people. This is my mother that we're speaking about here and my stepfather. And this is, this is, you don't know anything about what you're talking about. And so it, it felt, I feel very proud that I, that I did deal with it as, as honestly and directly as, as I did. Yeah, and I it's it's wonderful. I I watched the documentary as well. It's wonderful to see the two of you, you know, discuss that so personally and just and just hit that head on. And he speaks so eloquently about it as well. And and just being able to finally put you know some of that to rest. But what uh, what what's a what's an assumption about your mother that you wish people would stop talking about? Well, I would say maybe that she had a tragic life mm -hmm. or a doomed life or that she was a victim of the Hollywood system or, you know, I don't, I don't see her that way. I see her as this incredibly brave, like, like you guys use that word brave and empowered and courageous, self-reflective person who wanted to be so much more than a movie star you know she wanted to have an inner life she wanted to look within she wanted to know herself she built these friendships that lasted her lifetime and then la have lasted my lifetime you know and so i think she was very much in control of her life she was nobody's mm -hmm. fool and she she was awesome you know she was <laughs> And, and she died too young and that's the tragedy but her work lives on and 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 her courage lives on so that's what i want people to to know about yeah. her and if they haven't seen her films to watch some of them because you know she's indelible her presence is indelible is there a is there a particular movie that you feel is underrated that not enough people pay attention to I, I think Inside Daisy Clover is is underrated. Um, I think this property is condemned is underrated. Um, I think that this I think her finest work is in this property is condemned. Um, mm -hmm. And so yeah, I would say I think, and I think the fact that she never won an Oscar is underrated. Ah uh, yes, yeah. Yes, well, she, I mean, she's in good company there so. with a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. Well said, well said. <laughs> you know, certainly one of the favorites for a lot of people, though, is West Side Story. And we talked about how the industry kind of shut down, but some of the buzz lately has been about the, the remake of that movie. Uh, is that something that you're looking forward to going and, and seeing? Oh, my gosh, yes. First of all, I'm I'm such a fan of Steven Spielberg, and E.T. is like my all-time favorite <laughs> movie ever. And you know, Amblin Entertainment produced the documentary, and and Steven has been so incredibly supportive, and absolutely loves my mom. And so I, I know that, and and he's such a he, he loves film, you know. So if anybody is going to remake West Side Story, it, it should be him. And I'm, I'm really excited to see it though. When we were watching the trailer, um, I think it was, was it during the Golden Globes that they first showed it? I or think so. The Oscars, Oscars maybe. Or, yeah, my daughter, we watched the trailer and my daughter said, well, where's Grandma Natalie? Uh, no. <laughs> she said, this is a remake. She's not in this one. And she was like, what do you mean? Like she couldn't even fathom it, you know? And she goes, well, that's sad. And I was like, it's not sad because it, it's, you know, they can exist together. Uh -huh. And um, so I, I'm excited. And anything, anything that keeps her relevant, I think is great, you know? And so if people see this and 
love it, they may want to go and see the original one. And both of those films can exist side by side. Yeah. Yeah. And I got to tell you, when you watch her movie, she still comes across modern. I mean, there's some people from that era where you watch and you say, you know, their acting is of a certain time, but she feels, I mean, she, she's timeless and, and it's very modern when you watch her. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. I wonder if it was also because she didn't have that sort of affected mm. voice that mm -hmm. some actresses have. True. Though I would say, and I think I wrote this in my book, that when I was in trouble, she spoke to me in a very proper way. <laughs> you know, that it was like, sometimes I felt like it was like her interview voice that she mm. used. <laughs> she used it when I was in trouble and I always knew she would enunciate my name very properly and she would sit up very straight and she would let me know why this wasn't going to work out the way I wanted it. To. <laughs> uh, all the nicknames in the book, was that your mother? Was she the, the one that gave everybody the, the nicknames? Yes, she she loved nicknames and, and she, and my daddy Wagner loves nicknames too. And they, they gave each other a million nicknames and then, you know, Mart was the little prince and, or he had a, they had a million nicknames for him and Howard was H-E and yes, so many nicknames. And um, I, I kind of am like that too, I guess. We always have nicknames for, and we, we change the names of our animals. And you know, <laughs> I, I think that's like, I don't know. I guess it's just terms of endearment. Yeah, I, I feel. I mean, when you're reading the book, it feels it feels very lived in, and I think the nicknames help that. It really does. Yes. Oh, ooh, I love that word. Yeah. That's yeah. Sweet. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Well, uh, Natasha, we are running out of time. I can't believe it. It's been so. It's gone so fast. But uh, I guess one final question I wanted to ask you though is, if you could have the readers of this book get you know a couple things. A, you know, when, when they're finished reading, what, what are the couple things that you want most readers to take away from the book? Mm. Wow. Okay. Well, there's that Rilke quote. Um, I think it goes something like, let everything happen to you, beauty and terror, no feeling is final. Hmm. And I feel like that's sort of, you know, Feel, you got to feel it all. You got to let it happen. You don't have to be afraid that it's not, that you're going to die from your feelings, you know? Mm -hmm. And then just connection to the people that you love and yourself. Um, and maybe just, I mean, this sounds, this sounds like very self-helpy. I don't mean it to sound this way, but like, the gratitude for the life you were born into, you know, even if it isn't the one that you think you want in that moment, or I mean, there have been so many times where I was so angry about this life that I've had, you know, or, 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 or just so devastated by it. And, but it's my life. It, this is my life. And so we, we have to live the life that we've been born into. And I guess maybe that's the, the takeaway. Wonderful. Yeah, that's great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much once again for doing this. Thanks, you guys. This was so much fun. Good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks yeah, very much. Yeah, you, yeah, anytime you want to come on again, we'd love to have you. I The next time I have something to talk about, yeah. I, will, <laughs> I will find you guys, okay? Awesome. Appreciate that. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Natasha. Thanks, you guys. Thank Bye. you. You Bye. have a good one. You know, we, we said this off air earlier, Eric, but it really felt like talking to a friend for an hour with her. It did. She's so, it did. she's so warm and there's nothing affected about her. And, uh, yeah, I, I, we, we could have talked to her for much longer. And then, thank you, Natasha, for coming on our little podcast, but we loved it. It was a, a, an intimate conversation. And like you said, Brandon, it felt like talking to an old friend. It was great. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, 
we we didn't cover a lot that was in the book i mean there's so many that there's so many you know eccentric family members that are in the book that we didn't cover you know we didn't really talk about her siblings all that much and it's all covered in the book and and you really need to go out and read it because you really feel feel like you've lived life with the wood wagner family and um it's it's really really wonderful and just just to hear about natalie wood as a real person is 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 fantastic and it makes you sort of long for you know what we missed but you certainly do celebrate what we had yeah and again so the book is called more than love an intimate portrait of my mother natalie wood by natasha gregson wagner go find it it's a it's a great read and you get to learn all of those fun uh behind the scenes stories there are some characters in her family so we'll yeah. leave it at that <laughs> Yeah, so uh, another another fun interview. Um, we got a lot more coming up though this month. Um, we we've we've mentioned it before, but we're going to be uh, discussing White Heat, um, one of the great crime dramas from the '40s with James Cagney. Allison Means is joining us for that. Technically a noir film, so we, you know, yeah, we kinda... well, yeah, it 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 um it tiptoes around a lot of genres, and we'll cover yeah. that in the uh, in the yeah. in the book because I don't think I don't think a lot of historians can decide what it is. We'll cover all that, and then of course, um, guess who's coming to dinner? We'll be covering in September as well with our uh, editor in chief Jeremy Geckner. So a lot of stuff coming up, a lot of places where you can find us uh, f on Facebook, Front Row Classics Podcast, on Instagram, FRN Classics Pod. You can email us at classicsfrn at gmail.com. So many ways, let us know a movie you want us to talk about, a topic you want us to talk about, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll try and cover it. So a lot of stuff coming up and heading into the fall. I can't believe it. Me either. It's going no. fast, but we're having a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. So for Front Row Classics, I am Brandon. And I am Eric. And we will see you in the front row.